everybody, and welcome to A Case of the Jills. We have another awesome interview for you today, someone that I really want you to meet. Her name is Gretchen Mullen, and she is a licensed mental health counselor from the state of Florida and also licensed professional counselor in the state of Georgia. She is also a former fitness competitor. She's a former marathoner. She is a mom of two, and rumor has it that she makes a mean banana muffin. She, however, is not here to talk to us about banana muffins today. I asked her to talk to us more specifically about her personal history with uh, fitness, comp fitness competitions and sort of how her life and her health and her well being was affected by that. So, hi, Gretchen. Hi, how are you? I'm good. Um, everyone, we should let you know ahead of time that Gretchen and I um, are friends. So we're gonna be pretty casual with each other today and uh, I know most of our history. So I just want you to see that if, if we're kind of familiar with each other, the reason why is because we, we talk a lot. So um, I'm super excited that you're here today to talk about this. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you. Um, I also know that this was um, a little bit difficult to maybe start talking about, but I am super happy that you're willing to do it because we have a whole community of people here who watch this channel that come from a fitness competition side and are really interested in knowing other people's experiences, something that I don't have personal experience with. So I'm really happy that you're going to share your experience with the community. Well, I'm glad that I can help. Yeah. So let's just get right into it. What age did you start thinking about or getting into fitness competitions? So I, through my whole twenties, I was running marathons. And I was always involved in training for some sort of race. Um, I loved it. I did half marathons. I did a few full marathons. And then I hurt my foot from the most recent marathon I had done. And I was advised to stop running. So I was 29 when that happened. So I was 30 rolling into the whole bikini competition scene. Um, and that was when it became appealing to me because I wanted to be involved in something active, but I couldn't put the miles in running like I had been previously. Right. Okay. And so what drew you to bodybuilding? I mean, it's not something that everybody has experience with it. In fact, oh, I, I'm sorry, I said bodybuilding. I should have said fitness computer. Right. Right. I was, you know, I think I was, it was the kind of the thing to do. It was the Instagram thing of the moment. And it kind of still is, but really in the mid, it, it was 2015 when this became a thing for me. Um, and it was fitness everywhere, Fitspo, all this stuff. And, and I'm not going to lie. I think I got a little sucked into the sparkly bikini and the idea of it on stage. And it looked, it looked appealing, but I really liked the idea of the competition part. That was, that's always, I know I'm sure many of the people watching this channel have that drive. I'm very type A, very organized, very, I'm a very task driven, goal directed person. And so I liked the idea of this finite event to train for. Um, it was very different than running. Um, and it was appealing to me. And I, and I, I guess I had never, thought that I could shape my body. I kind of always just thought this is my body and this is what it does. And then people told me, oh, you can change your body. The reality is my first idea of my body was correct. I was sold a false idea of what my body could be, which got me where I am. So I, I think where I got you were. where you right, were, where I was, I'm sorry, where I was. Yes. Yes. That's, um, it's super interesting that you say that because, uh, you, what you're describing is the sort of competitive aspect of fitness competition that got you excited. Correct. A lot of times I do hear people that have a different kind of trajectory into that sport, which is just pure straight up body modification. But that really wasn't your initial, like you weren't thinking I'm overweight or I have, um, you know, body kind of image issues and I really want to change my body. Your relationship with your body up to that point was kind of fine. Would you say? I would say I was the typical 20 something. Like, I think I've always had body image issues. I wouldn't say they were any I don't know. I don't know how to rate them if they were more severe than the average person's. I would say I, I never thought I was fat. I wouldn't say I was walking around thinking I was fat or undesirable, but I, I wouldn't say I had a ton of confidence either. I was pretty, I think I was pretty average as far as any 20 year old something living in our culture with all this stuff coming at you. Um, I, I, I did like the idea of being able to look how I thought I could look. I would, again, I was really sold a bill of goods and I bought into it, but no, I don't think I was sitting around with horrific body image issues, but I do think it was there. Does that make sense? It wasn't like ruling my life, but it was kind of there. When you were kind of looking into how to get involved in the sport, what 
exactly did you do? Did you do internet research? Did you go to a gym? How did you seek out a coach? What was that all about? Well, I had a family member um, who I had a male cousin who was really successful. And again, when we talk about hormones, I had no clue about hormone, different hormone. I, I mean, I knew obviously men and women had very different hormones, but I didn't realize how I, I think some of these behaviors are far more damaging or damaging in a different way to women than to men. Um, I had no clue as I was doing this, that I'm, I wanted to have a babies in two years and that this was going to totally derail my trajectory of childbearing. I had no clue when I was entering that, but really the answer to your question was I had a male family member that was doing this and he was really successful and it, he was having a lot of fun doing it. Um, and then I met some other girls I went to college with that were doing it. So I really got, just kind of got exposed through people that I knew. Right. Um, and then I, I found a coach through some girls I had gone to college with. And so, really ori originally I wasn't even sure I wanted to compete. I just thought I wanted to weight lift. And then as I started working with this coach, she, we kind of discussed competing. So it just kind of evolved as the relationship with the coach evolved. Okay. All right. And you were married at this time. Yes. I had been married like a year and a half. Okay. Yeah. But you guys had not really talked about kids yet or you did, or what was your, um, we were both young professionals and we were both working a ton. We kind of wanted, we wanted kids early thirties and I was 29. So we knew in the next few years, we wanted to start trying. It wasn't too far off the mark, but nowhere in the pressing immediate. I asked that question because it's going to sort of factor into right. Right. Yeah. the end part of the story. Um, so tell me about your kind of like first week as a fitness uh, well, okay. So at the beginning, you were sort of in the bodybuilding mindset or sorry, you were in the weightlifting mindset. So what was the first like week like? Um, well, you... really, I was like going online and looking at how to do all these lifts and familiarizing myself with the machines. And then um, as I got into it, the more empowering it kind of was to learn to like, oh, I can build muscle here and I can sculpt here and I can do this. And that was really I think that fed the academic part of my brain to like, it was totally new. It was a brand new thing. It wasn't like running where I knew how to do tempo runs and do all these things that was so this was so new for me um and that was exciting and then to see other people that had physiques the more the more i was exposed to the weights the more the physique aspect became more important so as those things they kind of paralleled each other and that became really exciting the longer i was lifting especially the first few weeks i was lifting because it was so new um and i'll be honest i was seeing changes in my body really quickly at the beginning which again now knowing what i know there was a reason for that um, and would you like to tell us what that reason was well, my body was so, you know, you're introducing a new stimulus. So you're going to see new change very quickly, especially when you're in a caloric deficit, which I was. So those things went together. Um, and so I think I was so naive to think I was building muscle. I was not building muscle. I was simply removing body fat over muscle I already had and buying a bill of goods that was not accurate, <laughs> telling myself I was building muscle. So it was really a skewed perception of the reality of what was happening. What was really happening was I was drastically under eating losing body fat very rapidly. And therefore I was seeing more definition and muscle I had already had. Um, and then that, I mean, I don't know if you want me to talk about this now, but you know, the more that happened, the, the muscle loss then happened too. And I just became thin, <laughs> like very unhealthily thin, but, but in the beginning it was really pretty because I was still a, I still had the muscle mass. I wasn't underweight at this point for my body. So the beginning was really the elusive part that sucked me in because I wasn't having those, I wasn't having no symptoms yet. I was having no symptoms at this time, I mean, and everything, I didn't feel sick. I didn't feel bad yet. So it was really um, seductive. I guess that's the best way to put it. It really, really was. And so you, uh, up to that point, just to be clear, you were uh, athletic as a young person, right? So you kind of had this body that was used to sport and probably was able to build muscle. So you weren't coming into this from nothing. You had kind of a background in athletics and sport. Yeah, I, I had a background in performance and this was so different than performance. I mean, it kind of was because you were trying to lift heavy, but this was really aesthetic driven, like the more I got into it. And I had never, I think I shared this with you before, food to me was always just fuel to perform. Now it was being used as a tool to change my physique, which was so new because food was always just, I had never counted a calorie. I didn't know what a macro was. I had no clue. All I knew was I ate carbs before I ran a race and I ran races and I had fun with my friends and life was great. And now I was manipulating everything I ate to change a specific part of my body, which was totally different. So that was, I enjoyed that. I mean, I'm going to be honest, my brain enjoyed it was like Tetris with my food every day to like, if I can get the right equation, I can look the way I want to look to win this competition. And it was, it really sucked me in. It really took over my life. And in the, but in the beginning, it was fun. Right. And so where did you, obviously, if you didn't really have much experience with this and you had this family member, 
where did you learn sort of the ins and outs um, of macro counting, calorie counting? Um, I guess one of the things that people talk about a lot um, when they email me or in this community, people talk about gaining all of this information from sources and wishing that they could forget it, never having a hard time forgetting that information. So if you came from not knowing it to knowing it, where were you sourcing that information from? Was it colleagues? Was it friends? Um, and sort of what was the relationship between the concept of having to manipulate your intake? Like, was it just like, yeah, this is what we do. This is normal. Like how it goes. <laughs> yeah, yes. Cause I was in a group that was run by this group of this particular person of all these women that were doing this. And some of these women were doing this to compete and some were doing it to just change their bodies. So I was inundated with women that were tracking macros and then it's like a funnel, you know, that I was funneled down into the women that were competing. And honestly, I just, I, I was taking advice from them and I was using my fitness pal, as I'm sure you've heard. And, and we were sharing recipes and recipes that were macro friendly. I'm putting this in quotes because it's also, <laughs> it was so unhealthy, but at the time I really, it was really normalized really quickly. And again, for someone that is type A goal directed, and I always loved math. It was like every day was like a new math equation to reach a goal with how I could manage my food. Um, and it really became something that I just did. Um, and then you can learn, you know, you can see food and it's like, that's four ounces of chicken. That's 28 grams of protein. And that's this, I mean, it was really became something where I couldn't, I couldn't even go out to eat without seeing a meal as just a meal. It was like, like a math equation. Right. So to answer your question, it was groups of people. And then, um, you know, we, we were given direction on like where to find like you know, like if you get a piece of steak, like you had, I was on like the US, I was on the USDA website looking up steak. And I mean, I thought that this was what you did. I really did. And I was like, and then there were debates on, do you use cooked weight or raw weight? I mean, this was the level of like, this was the level of precision that I was doing. And I really had this belief, the more precise I was, the more likely I would be to succeed. And I was applying the same rules and guidelines I did to like achieving my bachelor or my master's degree to a fitness competition, you know, it really did start as just like, I thought I was being healthy. I thought, and, and, and the more I bought into this, the more I thought that what I was doing before that was unhealthy. And that was a big problem was like, I was sold this idea that I was overeating before. And now for the first time I wasn't. And in reality, I was feeding my body before. And for the first time in my life, I was really under eating. Okay. That's an important distinction. I want to sort of um, figure out where the shift was from you saying at a certain point you were weightlifting um, so weightlifting in general wouldn't necessitate a specific diet, right. To build muscle, we would say, but then at a certain point you were like, well, let's take that, but now we're going to tweak it to kind of make my body look a certain way to do a certain thing. And in between there, there must've been some kind of mind shift about what constitutes health, right? So Correct. What were you thinking was healthy before versus what became healthy to you as you're uh -huh. turning it along? Well, it's interesting because when I was running training for the race that led to my foot injury, I remember we were joint, we were trying to find a new gym and I went to like, I'm not going to name the gym, but it's a really big chain of a gym. And they did the typical like sales pitch thing and they took my body fat percentage. And now knowing what I know, my body fat percentage was totally normal, like totally healthy when they took it. Um, and I remember leaving that appointment feeling like, my body fat percentage was too high because they were trying to get me to buy a membership. Um, he didn't say I had a high fat body fat percentage, but he goes, I can help you get this down, you know? And so that, that put that in, that was end of the year that kind of put that in my head. And then as I started to lose body fat training, I, I thought that I was doing something good for my body. I thought that I thought that I had too high of body fat before, and that that was maybe why I wasn't as fast as I wanted to run. And, and I was a fine runner. I wasn't slow, but, but these little ideas contributed to the spiral that was eventually destruction. <laughs> right. um, but, but that's kind of where it took over was these small little pieces of information that became, I guess, the computer chip of like what drove this. Cause it was just, I guess it just became second nature. I, I know that this kind of concept will resonate with a lot of people. The idea that, you know, it's not just one thought it's, it's a group of tiny little seeds that are planted along the way. Um, and it could be an innocent conversation with a person. And all of a sudden you're thinking to yourself, I'm, I, my body is wrong. There's something wrong with my body. And in order for me to be healthier or more successful or better at being me, I need to do this other thing. And it's going to help me get to a successful place. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so that's very interesting. I'm glad you said that because I do get a lot of people that will say things like, you know, they just don't know how they got here. So it's important to recognize that we don't always know exactly the one thing. There's many things and that's um, not our fault, by the way. It's the environment we live in and, right. and what we expose ourselves to. So tell me about your weight loss. Obviously, you're not going to tell us how much you lost, but how rapidly did you lose weight? So I lost about 17% of my total body weight in like a five month period. Is that okay to say like that? So a big, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, a bit, to give you an idea, it was like almost one fifth of my body weight in five months. So, um, not quite, I did the math the other day, but it was really quick. And I think I want to point out, like, I didn't experience any negative symptoms for the first half of that. That second half of that chunk is when it really got messy. So, so it no was symptoms for the beginning part, which is how long? I'd say that, let me think in my head. So April, May, June, July, August. I would say three months in, this is about, when I hit that three month mark of doing this and that weight was falling off really quickly, that third month is when I started to not feel well. And the third month is when the food thoughts became really intrusive and I really had no clue what was going on. And I had, you know, learning what I learned through this and I reading the Minnesota starvation experiment and reading these things, like I resonated so much with, I could not focus. I was looking at recipes. I was on food channel. I mean, things I didn't even, I, I, as a mom, I don't like cooking. I joke with my, I mean, I cook for my family, but I'm not, I'm not someone that in, takes enjoyment in cooking. And I was just scouring recipes all the time. I would think of new things to cook that would fit into my macros. It was just I had, no, it was bizarre. Cause I'm like, why am I thinking about this all the time? I don't even like to cook, but it was, now I realize it was a physiological, <laughs> I mean, I was in physiological distress, but had no clue. And that's why I wanted to come on here and share this was I'm an educated woman. I am not a stupid person. And this happened to me. And I'm thinking if this happened to me, it's happening to other educated people, you know? And, and I felt really silly that this happened to me, but it, it's, it can happen. It, it just did. And I, I think that if it happened to you, it's okay. Like there's a way out of this, but no, I'm glad you say that because that's exactly what we're trying to establish like through this whole interview is that so many of these things, you know, it's, it's nature and it's nurture. It's maybe some aspects of someone's personality that they're a little type A and these um, types of sports become compelling, right? They fulfill a need for that person, maybe some control, maybe some insecurity for some people. And then you mix that up with your kind of environment and the messages that you're getting and you end up with this cocktail of kind of destruction, especially, especially hormonal destruction. It has right. nothing to do with intelligence and it has nothing to do with, um, you know, how smart we are, how much, how much schooling we've had, how many degrees we've piled up. Um, and even in your case, the fact that we actually work in mental health, it took you a really long time to recognize that this mm -hmm. was no longer just a physical issue. This was becoming a mental issue. And I would, I would say what was the, were those like food thoughts coming in? Was that like a big indicator to you? That um, I think the biggest eye-opening piece was I had not seen my family, my, my husband and he will, he was there through all of this. But I think when you're living with someone every day, it's hard to, kind of like when like watching babies grow, like I don't watch notice the, how much my son's grown until I, I'm like, wow, it's been a month and you're bigger. I think he, he noticed I was getting too thin when I was already kind of in the depths of it. Um, I had not seen my family though. And we went on a vacation in August. This had all really, really taken off in like April. And my parents were really concerned. They were really, and they had not seen me. So I think that kind of started me thinking maybe this wasn't an issue, but I, again, the, I had not competed yet. That was coming up, but, but, um, I remember when we were on that vacation and of course I was eating all my own food and cooking all my own food. It was in, interfering with our vacation, the way I was eating. And that became my first thought of like, this seems to be, I had an intensity about food because I was starving <laughs> that again, I did not know how hungry I was. And I, I really want to touch on that in a minute, but my, I couldn't wait to eat with the family because I was so hungry and I had to like I, I just couldn't function without my meal at like 4 45. Like I joke like the early bird special because I was starving. Um, you know, and, and it was interfering with our trip. And we were at national parks and I was like going to the car to get my protein bar that fit into my macros and missing the wildlife because I was so hungry. And and I think what I what I wanted to share was, you know, I didn't know that was hunger. And I know that sounds I feel really silly saying that, but I did not know that this was hunger. I thought that this was weakness and what I was I thought I was failing at what I was doing because I was thinking about food rather than, no, you're hungry and your body's shutting down, Gretchen. It was like, well, I'm not doing it right because I'm thinking about food. And that was that was fitness culture, was that you should be able to power through and grind it out and do your cardio and lift your weights and ignore what your body's telling you. I was really taught to ignore my body, basically. 
for so a long time. What were some of the other symptoms that you started to experience? What were some of the other maybe non-intuitive signs of hunger you think that you were experiencing at that time? I was, I was starting to lose my hair. That was a big one. Like, um, not like my, I was, we talked about postpartum hair loss. This was not postpartum hair loss. This was like clumps and clumps and clumps and clumps of hair. That was very like, I remember sitting in the shower, like in tears, like what's, why, what's happening? That was really alarming. And then freezing all the time. And we went to a wedding with a family out of a family member in October. And I, my husband couldn't come. So I had my family and I had like an adjoining like a room and I had cranked the heat up when they were gone. I just thought it was cold. It was California. It's California. It was Santa Barbara. It was not that cold. And I think it was like 82. I cranked up to 82 and my parents came in and were sweating and like opening the window and I'm shivering. I mean, I was in bed under a blanket shivering in 82 degrees. Um, that was pretty like, that was hard to ignore at that point. You know, it's like no one else is cold. And my other family, the members that hadn't seen me were asking if I was okay. So, I mean, these, they, these things became really glaring once I kind of tipped over that edge of that second half of that weight loss. Like I said, that one fifth of my body weight, that second half of that fifth was really, everyone was like, what's wrong with Gretchen? Is she okay? I can't imagine that you were like a ray of sunshine in that moment either. You must've been kind of moody and kind of. Yeah. You know, I was running my own business. Um, I, my, my own business was taking off and I remember being really overwhelmed with like billing things that are normal parts of business, like billing issues I was having. I can remember driving home one night and being really agitated about a billing issue and almost cr crying over. I mean, it, like, this is how bad it got. Like I was crying on the way home about an insurance issue that like is normal part of business, but this is the part that people don't get it. This is a, this affects everything. My ability to regulate my emotions, my composure, my coping. Um, yeah. And I didn't know what was going on. That was the scariest part. I had no clue. This was all about being malnourished. And the message is just, because this is an important part of this, um, the messages that you were getting either through the community or on social media were about encouragement, normalization of these things, right? What were some of the things that you were being told like in that community and what were you kind of understanding based on, you know? Right. Yeah. Well, one thing that I think also I didn't realize is you look really different when you're in a bikini and you're really tanned. You can't see how ill you look when you're not in the tan. Like I didn't look ill on stage with five shades darker of my normal skin color. You know, I didn't, I looked in the way the angles are in the lights on stage. I looked not ill and then off stage, I looked really not well. And so I was getting a lot of positive feedback of how I looked on stage and how I did. And then, um, you know, off stage people, it was totally different. So it was really confusing. And, and I was in some denial. I just thought people that were not in the competing world didn't understand. So how many times did you actually compete? Twice. And did you, I don't really know much about fitness competitions, but from what I've been told is that, you know, you will kind of like train for a certain point. There'll be a period of time where you're allowed to sort of gain a little bit of weight again, I guess. And then you'll train again, you'll go on prep, I guess, till your next competition. Did you kind of follow that similar trajectory? So my macros got increased because I'm sure I was having like metabolic, I don't know what was happening to me, but I was not gaining weight on like more and more and more food. And I was just losing weight, which I know now is like my metabolism was just compensating and you know, all the things that it does when you're so hungry. Um, so yeah, my, my food got increased and I was reverse dieting, reverse dieting into the next show. Um, but my food now, I thought I was on so much food. I'm not even going to talk about how many carbs I was eating, but at the time I thought it was so much. And now I like laugh at how much I was truly eating. And I think, you know, considering the energy expenditure on top of that, it was just not enough food. It was just, I mean, I joke, I could eat that for breakfast now, you know, it was just, it was not enough food. I was starving, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I kind of reversed into the next show, but, um, my calories went up a little bit. They had been increasing because I couldn't keep weight on. And did you, did you enjoy the shows? Like, was it fun? Was it good? No, it was not fun. <laughs> I had a really negative experience the first time. Um, there's a lot of politics in particular organizations when it comes to placing. And that was the part I was also really naive about was it's who, you know, who you train with, what coach you have. It, there was nothing really objective about it. Um, based on what I, I'm like a little naive, honest scratching going in there thinking you're going to be judged on symmetry and all the things that I thought bodybuilding fitness competitions were and it was not that it was really who trained with who and then I did an I did an NPC show and then I did a natural organization the second time and it, the second one was better but it still was not it was like a big wind out of my sail it was not great hmm what color was your bikini I just want to know blue 
both times yeah we're the same one they're not they're not cheap they're no, very not. <laughs> yeah <laughs> crazy um so i want to ask you about something a little bit controversial um because this is something that nobody really talks about but i've often been curious about it and um what i notice is that for my followers who are fitness competitors or who are in the bodybuilding world, there is this kind of obsession with um, cheat days and kind of like uh, what I eat in a day videos and uh, 10,000 calorie challenges on YouTube. And I've heard many people talk to me about being becoming obsessed with these things. Can you explain to me, oh, and some, something about like the day after you compete, like what happens with food and stuff. Can you kind of talk to us about that? Because I think it's important for people to hear what your experience is and like how that kind of plays into this weird food kind of like obsession rejection cycle. So some people have an easier time with this than I did. So I didn't, the, the what that I subscribe to, I didn't have a cheat day. We had a high carb day. So it's like, it's a good, more structured cheat day, but you got allotment of carbs your carbs went up, your fats went down. So you still had us prescribed macros for that day, but it was supposed to be like, your cheat day. I laugh now because it's so funny to me saying this. Um, so that's how I did it. I, a lot of people I know would kind of compete and then go off. I, want, I don't want to say go off the rails, but like eat unrestrictedly until they kind of got back on however many days that was. My coach actually told me to do that, but I was, I'm, I could not do that. I was very anxious. Um, I had a really hard time just eating and listening to my body. And I still stuck to like, I didn't track the days after I, I didn't track as far as like trying to stick to the macros, but I still logged everything I ate. And by this point I was in so deep, the thought of not logging my food was, I couldn't do it. I mean, I was so anxious, could not, I mean, I had my little phone tracker out. We went to, where did we go for my show? I think we went to Outback and I got a burger and fries and I found it on the menu and I like logged it in my fitness pal. And so a lot of people have an easier time with that than I do. I remember people backstage eating brownies and cookies, other competitors, and I was too anxious. I couldn't do it. Um, which is another sign of the severity of where I got myself mentally in all of this. Um, but a lot of people go off and just eat unrestrictedly and put on a good, good chunk of body fat and feel better quickly. And that's what I want to touch on. I, I was too anxious to do that. And I think had I allowed myself to do that, I would have felt better physically a lot sooner. But I have this, like, my anxiety held me back and I was like a turtle, like to put weight back on, which is why I was sick for so long. But um, yeah, I think the 10,000 calorie challenges become really fun to watch when you're starving. And I just from experience, I would watch a lot of that stuff um, amidst this whole journey I was on. And my husband was so sick of it. He's like, turn off YouTube. I'm sick of these fitness people. You, I mean, he was so over me when these fitness videos with food and food consumption. He's like, who, cause people would normalize like other competitors. I remember they would go to dinner and they'd split a burger with each other cause it fit into their macros. And I, I thought this was normal eating. So the thought of really allowing myself to feed my body normally I don't like the word normal, but in a way that was intuitive to me, it was really, really scary because I was starving and I could have eaten, I could even, I could have eaten a lot because I was so hungry. I think anyone could probably stumble across that once and not have an issue. If you're doing the things I was doing where it was all of the time, there's probably something going on and you're probably hungry. You're probably hungry. I saw, you know, I ended up seeking professional help and that's how I eventually, you know, got to, to finding you, Jill, was I had no clue that this was all star. I was starving. I, and I don't want to say hunger. I was starving. And I remember eating X amount of calories, it doesn't matter how much, after a show and going into this dietitian and telling her how much I ate and feeling so ashamed I had eaten this much. And she goes, what is wrong with that? You are hungry. And I had no clue that that, that was okay. I felt so guilty and paralyzed in the guilt. I had to get back on this train and work all this food off and you don't have to work off food. I was hungry. So I would say, yes, if, you're, if you are constantly watching videos about food, you need to ask yourself, are you hungry? Are you thinking about food all the time? Because right. I'm not hungry anymore. And I don't think about food unless I'm actually hungry. Like I'm not starving anymore. I just, I want to shift forward and ask you about um, the mindset shifts because you just started to go into the, the point where, okay, I, don't, I can't do this anymore. So can you explain sort of what exactly was happening in that moment? Where did the did you hit a rock bottom? Did you hit a brick wall? Did you fall off a cliff? Like what was that all about? So I stopped, my competitions were September and October of 2015. I stopped my birth control pill in 20, in November. And I had no period when I came off of it. Shocking. Um, but I should mention too, back in that August vacation we took, um, I got to the placebo pills and my birth control and I did not get a period on the birth control pill. 
So yeah, that's, yeah. So I was not even responding to birth control anymore at, at that point. So from August to November, I don't even know how much wreckage I had done, but it was bad. And then November was when we wanted to start trying to have kids. And that was when, or we wanted to start like being able to at least entertain the idea. And I had no period. And that was when it became, I was panicked of what is wrong. You know, I'm not even having a period at all. I have no female hormonal symptoms at all. So that was, that was kind of the wake up call. Just to make sure I get the timeline, right? So how many months into starting the dieting, did you lose your period? So I lost it on birth control. I'm, I'm guessing three or four. Okay. Cause I could have, I mean, I could have lost it theoretically before it stopped on the pill. You know I mean? This was my guess is I had major hormonal disruption before it quit showing up on the pill. Right. So I'm, I'm guessing it didn't take long. I think once I, I kind of know where my body's happy and I don't think it was even a function of the amount of weight I lost. I think it was, I think it was the amount coupled with the speed like you and I have talked about. I think the speed in which I lost it, my body was like, what is going on? I have, I had always been this happy little weight range effortlessly for my whole adult life. And then I shoved myself so far below that. I think my body like freaked out. So it did not take long. Okay. So now you're like, so the impetus really for you to try to get healthy was that you wanted to have kids. Is that, Yeah. if you, if you just, you know, I know we can't like, you know, rethink the history, but do you think that if becoming fertile was not necessarily on your radar at that time. Do you think you would have continued? Honestly, probably. Um, do I think it would have lasted long? I don't know, but I, I think I would eventually have gotten here where I am today with you. I don't think it would have happened as quickly. Okay. That's but but I, I do think it would have, I think my body would have shut down eventually. I mean, it was not going well for me physically. So I think it would have led me to really being unable. To, I was able to function through this, not well, but I was, I was able to still work and but my relationships were suffering, things were starting to suffer. So I think this would have come to a head. I just don't think it would have happened as soon because I really wanted babies. <laughs> I, I have to say that when you tell me this, and I've heard you tell me this before, and you were working as a therapist all this time, Correct. you were doing this. And uh, girl, I don't, I don't know how you talk to people and can maintain your train of thought on a starved brain. I don't, that's some like serious, like superhuman yeah, I think, I think I had this ability to like turn it almost hyper-focus. Um, I mean, I, I do think I was still able to be, I think I was still good in, at what I did, but I think I could be better. I'm a better me now. I'm better at everything I am in my life now on yeah. food. I think I was able to function and get by, but I, I don't think I was the best version of me by any means. And I would always plan my food around work. So it was like I was eating, working, and the food I did allow myself was around my around work. Right. Yeah. Okay. Fair. All right. So now you're like, I'd like to have children. What is step one? So the step one was what is wrong with me? Cause I knew nothing about hypothalamic amenorrhea until this happened to me. I just knew I didn't have a period. So I went to a doctor, the wonderful OB. Um, and the doctor loved the BMI and all the things that we know are probably not super helpful. And I was still technically what is considered normal, not normal for my body, but what is the doctors considered to be normal. Um, however, she did recognize there was a body fat problem, um, which at least she picked that up, but she still was very, she used a lot of metrics um, to just kind of assess my problem, which my brain loves metrics. So that was a way for me to kind of stay in denial about the problem. So we're rolling into 2016 now. Mind, mind you, my son wasn't born until 2018. So this was not an easy journey to get this baby. I um, remember. <laughs> yes. so 2016, it was the year of the diagnosis as I very slowly put weight back on. But I mind you, I was still compulsively tracking macros. I was still compulsively in the gym. And now I had found myself post-competition, not wanting to compete anymore, but also so afraid to stop. And I don't even know what I was afraid of. Um... I do. I think I was afraid of exploding. I mean, I'll be honest. I was afraid of all the things I know that aren't accurate, but I was afraid of just blowing up if I stopped doing what I was doing. When you say blowing up, you mean? I thought I would put on 50 pounds rapidly. Um, and, and I want to say that looking back, that wasn't even the worst thing in the world now knowing what I know. But at the time I was, my body image was so bad. And I also want, I think this is something that's important. My body image got better the more weight I gained. I feel better about how I look as I put weight on. Now, once I got there, not in the process, but once I got there, like now, and I won't talk about how much heavier I am, that doesn't matter, but I'm so much 
I can see myself so much more accurately now. The, the less body fat I had, the more insecure I felt. And as I put it on, that got better. Body, body fat and body weight, both. All of them. Yes. They went together for me. Right. Right. That's important. I'm glad, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, can I ask you to put your therapist hat on for one second? Yes, absolutely. And so if you, cause I know you do deal with people with uh, disordered eating patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and when people step in and they sit down and talk to you and their level of anxiety is super high and you can see, or they've told you that they're undernourished um, and they're not eating and maybe they're exercising too much or maybe not. Um, a question I get all the time is, you know, I need this kind of lifestyle to manage my anxiety. So as a therapist and as someone who's been through this, and based on what you just said, that gaining weight helps you helps that anxiety go away. How, what, are, what is, what, how do you talk to people that sit in front of you and say, I can't, I don't believe you. I don't believe this is going to happen. I think, you know, for me, education and I love science and I think science, it depends. It depends on the client. Is the client truly someone who has an eating disorder that needs residential treatment to stabilize? Or is this someone like the overtrained athlete or the body? I mean, there's, they're same, but they're also differences as we've talked about. There's a difference between the overtrained athlete and the chronically anorexic person that the needs are different. Like, yes, they, they both have needs to restore body fat to some degree, but the way you get there is different depending on the person. So I'm going to speak about the overtrained athlete or the bikini competitor for a minute. Yeah. So in that case, um, education is really helpful. So I had no clue about set point theory. No clue. Didn't know that exists. Didn't know it was a thing. Had no clue that my body had mechanisms in which it liked I didn't know that my body liked to be a certain weight and the way that the fitness community kind of sells it is that you get to pick where you, what you weigh, you get to pick it and choose it. And, and that's up to you. And that's not true. And when that was explained to me by a dietitian, it was like a light bulb. I, I wouldn't say it was overnight, but that was really helpful. So I think education about the way the physiology of a person works is helpful. Um, that really kind of got the ball spinning, the ball rolling for me about what this meant, what food meant, my relationship with food. So I think that's, that would be where I would start. Psychoeducation about um, the physiology of how bodies work, how body fat percentages, well, not body fat percentages, but you know, the amount of body fat your body wants to have to function optimally as it relates to hormone function. Um, and also I think assessing the motivation of the client, you know, in my case, like, pregnancy was really important. Being a mom was, a, I had a biological drive to be a mother. Not everyone does that. That's not everyone's drive for me. That was important. Um, and so I think understanding for me, I need X amount of body fat for this egg to come out of my ovary. That was helpful to understand that like this has to happen. I don't get to choose anymore. Right. So I think assessing, providing education in those areas is really important with regard to anxiety and using the sport to manage anxiety. There are other coping skills. I did not believe that there were, but there are. Um, and exploring those other coping skills is really important, but also I'm a really like reality-based clinician. I do some CBT stuff, but I think part of this involves doing stuff you do not want to do. This is not comfortable. This is not easy. This was a white knuckling, really painful time. And I've talked to you about, you know, I, I went on Zoloft during this time. It was really painful. It was scary. I had to eat food and be uncomfortable in my body as it changed. And there was just kind of part of that that was required to get me to my end goal. So I think being very honest with the client and saying, this is not going to be fun. It's not going to be easy. But if you want to get to the other side of this, we have to go through it. And how can we help you cope along the way? And there are other ways to manage anxiety besides weightlifting and compulsive exercise. And you might like them better. Yeah. I like the way I cope now way better than lifting weights in a gym, tracking carbohydrates and tomatoes. Like it's just made way more fun now. I, I love that you said all that. That's super important. I get questions about that stuff all the time. And um, I'm so glad that you can speak to it from both the clinical side and your personal experience. I think that's super impactful. Um, I want to go back to your recovery process. And uh, so you white knuckled it, as you said, it was difficult. You had to make a lot of hard decisions. You had to start making changes. If you could kind of share maybe your experience with yeah. all of 2016, I think I was still working. I don't remember how long I worked with this coach, but I was still putting weight back on and reverse dieting as I was getting di like the official diagnosis of amenorrhea. Um, and then when 20, 2017, after I still wasn't even close to cycling, because I still was not eating close to enough, and I was still way over training. You can't, for me, I could not lift weights and do cardio for an hour and a half a day, the intensity I was doing it and ovulate. That was not going to happen, um, especially with still not even, I needed to be in a surplus, and I was still, I probably barely hit maintenance. I don't think I was even at maintenance. I did a, um, we did an injectable cycle of like a fertility treatment. We went to the 
endocrinologist who also told me my weight was not a problem. He said I was at normal weight. You know, they looked at the BMI again and he, his, in, in his defense, his job is to get you a baby. That's sure. his job. That's what you do. So we spent several thousands of dollars on trying on one cycle, which is just baffling to me. Like one cycle costs several thousand dollars. And I, I really believe this happened for a reason that cycle did not work, which I was still underweight and not eating enough. Um, and I ended up having a cyst on my ovary at when we were, we were going to start another cycle and I had a cyst and we couldn't start it, which was the best thing that ever happened to me at the time I was devastated. It was the best thing. Cause at that point it was February of 2017. Now we're a year into me figuring out I have no period. And I was just done. I'm like, I, I'm, I, my way is not working. My way of doing this is just not working. I'm wasting my fa- my money. I knew deep down in my heart that this was a problem. And my husband had brought up my exercise to the doctor and I was not pleased that he did that. I was kind of embarrassed. Um, and the doctor told me it was actually not a problem. Now knowing what I know, it was totally a problem. But at that point was when I just, I stopped, I quit the gym, I quit my membership. Right. And that was, that was March of 17. Um, and I was really, I had, I had some much, I had more weight to gain from that point. So that was when I really was serious about getting my body back to um, some semblance of what was normal for me. And I quit weighing myself. I quit lifting weights and I just was walking. Um, and, and really though, the not tracking the food was the bear of the, that was the challenge. That was really hard. That was one of the serious about stopping tracking food. I do remember, I do remember you talking about just the numbers popping up into your head, whether or not you wanted to like see them, that you would just pick something up and be like, boom, 200 calories, boom, 80 calories, like without you wanting that. Um, how did you cope with that? How did that, um, how, how stressful was that? <laughs> it was miserable, but the solution was eating. I hate to say that the solution is more food and it gets better, but you have to just eat the food. I don't see, I, I'm not going to say it's to, I would say if I'm in a good place with all the things I need to do to keep myself healthy, it's, I just have food again. I'm back to like just eating meals with my family and having my kid give me a wheat thin and all the things that are just would have been unheard of, like, you know, three years ago or not three, four years ago, but it took time. It just, I had to eat the food and, and fake it. I mean, I really had to just do a lot of faking it and eating food. And, and, and I, what I want to say is because I'm a mental health professional, and this isn't the only reason, but I recognize my need for professional help. I had a lot of professional help through this. I was in therapy. I saw dietitians. I reached out to you. I did. I mean, I, I had a lot of help and I don't know that I'd be here without it. Um, being a clinician does not make me immune from the human condition. And I, I needed a lot of help. And then I, I, the therapy helped me tremendously because the anxiety around the food was the biggest hindrance. And I think that for me, it was a two pronged thing because I have anxiety anyway, but then being hungry makes you anxious. So it was like the physiological anxiety I had control over. I could, by feeding myself, I could help that. The other piece of my anxiety, which is organic in me, that was what the mental health person, my therapist helped me do. He helped me manage that, which allowed me to then put the fork to my mouth. Well, that's perfect. Cause what you're saying is this was not a simple fix of one thing that you had to do or stop doing. It Correct. was a lot of different pieces coming from different areas, a lot of different things to unravel. Um, I think it's really important to recognize what you said, which is that you had a baseline anxiety already Correct. that you were aware of. And I think um, for better or for worse, a lot of people come into abusing exercise Correct. from a mindset that starts out with anxiety. That is really, as you said, gonna be fixed with a properly nourished brain, mm-hmm. like period. It is gonna be the thing that you're going to look back and say, how did I survive mm-hmm. on that brain that had you know, not enough glucose? You know, how did I do it? Right. Mm-hmm. I think people want a quick fix. They want to look at one thing to change. Um, but it's really not, it's a, it's a variety of things right. that really have to be addressed. Correct. But I think that the first thing in, in this whole process, you can't get anywhere if you're, if you're starving. And I learned that I tried, I tried to stay in this week. You talked about it, quasi recovery in your last video you know, I tried that. It doesn't work. Um, and I think accepting that I was hungry was also helpful. It was okay to be hungry. I, I, I thought that was doing something wrong. I was trained to think if you're hungry, it was bad and and you, you need to eat. So I, the food is paramount. It just had to happen first. I I think it's interesting what you just said. You said you were trained to think that hunger was bad or to ignore it. I was told, I was given tricks of how to, cause you're starving at nighttime when you're in prep. And I was given tricks of thing. I'm not going to say them because it's so unhealthy, 
things to do to manage the hunger without eating and go to sleep. I mean, it's like baffling. We are going to do a second video together where we're going to talk more about your uh, journey into motherhood and beyond. But if you could, at this point, talk about, for, for the people who are not going to watch that video, let's talk about the benefits of recovery. Oh my gosh, so many. Um, just being able to go places and eat food with your family and all these things. Like my food was not fun anymore. Not, not food has more than one purpose. It, yes, it's to fuel your body, but it's also a part of everything in our culture, like events and birthday parties. And, you know, I can eat birthday cake with my kids and do all, you know, things that I don't have to put in a food tracker when I eat a piece of cake, you know, it's, it's, my life is enriched again, you know, it's just so much better. Um, you know, all the, the physiological benefits. I'm not freezing anymore. Um, my body image is better. I feel better in my own skin. I'm not tired all the time. I mean, I could go on. My sleep is better. And I, I think one thing I want to talk about, and this was, this was all, your other question was like, what was an eye-opening experience? I'll never forget this. I woke up one time. I thought it was the morning. I went out to make an egg. I got a pan out of my kitchen to prepare an egg and it was three o'clock in the morning. That is, that is starvation. I was going to prepare breakfast. I was so hungry. I woke up out of a dead sleep to make an egg that doesn't happen anymore. I sleep through the night. I am hungry. I'm, I mean, I am full and everything's better. Everything is better. Um, and I think I had this fear that if I recovered and gained this weight, I would be, have all these bad things happen. And it was the opposite. Everything's better. And I joke about this because my husband finds me far more attractive now. And he well, you, are, you are cute. I have to say. Well, thank you. But I mean, <laughs> I, I could not imagine that because I was, when I was at this peak of the physical condition that I thought I was the best shape of my life. He was not into it. I mean, he supported me because I was into it, but he, he didn't like it. He thought I did not look well and I didn't, he was right, but it's, everything's better. Our marriage is better. We communicate better. Everything is better. And, and looking to, let's be real. If your personality is such that, you know, you're kind of a type A, um, being honest, do you, do you still get type A about stuff? If, you know, if it's, if it's, <laughs> it's not, you, I mean, you know, this, I tell you, I still, I'm not, it's not like it's all rainbows all the time. And I'm still stressed. I get, still get stressed and have normal life stressors. And I still have, you know, I'm postpartum now. We'll talk about that in another video. There's still the body image stuff is not perfect, but I can deal with it now. I have ways to like manage it without going to like, I'm going to skip a meal or I'm going to eat. Actually, I never skipped meals. I just ate like a snack sized portion of a meal. And I laughed because I watched what my toddler eats. I'm like, oh my God, he's eating more than I ate when I was prepping for these shows. He really is, you know? So the insanity of it was so grave and I just couldn't see it. So yeah, it's, it's not perfect. We're all a work in progress, but, um, you know, I still, I still see a therapist. I still take care of myself. There's life is crazy. This pandemic, all these things, but I can't deal with all any of the other life stuff. If I'm hungry, I just can't. Um, and also like being a mom, I owe it to my children to be, in my opinion, like I owe it to them to be the best version of me. And I can't do that if I'm not taking care of myself. And I also don't want my kids to see me weighing food. Like that's really important to me. Like I thought that I was told that to have the, a healthy physique, you had to weigh your portions and I don't want my children to think that that's okay. Or I don't want to pass this on to them. So that's really important to me. Really important. Yeah. I love that. I love the fact that, um, the behaviors that you have now that you couldn't even imagine in the past are the ones that have made you the better version of yourself and the, the, the person to, to look up to, to emulate, like probably there are some point in your past where you were like, I don't want to be like that. And now you are something that is actually a better version of who you could have ever been before. Right. And I think too, like the exercise piece, you know, I do fun stuff with my kids now and we go on walks and that I never considered walking exercise before. And now that I'm a mom, I'm like, this is hard. Like we're walking three miles with a stroller and it's hard, you know, so, but I can do that with my family. Living in a gym alone with a calorie tracker is really lonely. I mean, it was really lonely and I was always by myself and no one was going to interfere with that. And I would, I would find gyms on vacation and like buy these day passes to go work out. And I don't have to do that today. And I'm, and I'm not suggesting that exercise is bad. I don't want anyone to think that it's wonderful, but it should not be your whole entire life. And there's ways to move your body that are intuitive, not compulsive. And I did not know how to do that before I got better. Amazing. I love this conversation. This is so great. We got through so much in a relatively short period of time. Before we wrap up though, um, is there anything else that you would like to share either as Gretchen, the former, um, competitor or Gretchen, the therapist, is there anything else that you want to just share? Yeah. I think the biggest thing is I, I have learned that it is not, 
our bodies are not made for us to decide what they look like. Um, our, our job is to take care of them. And those are two very different things. And, and I was told that they were the same thing and, and they're not, they're very different. So if I'm, if I am feeding my body and eating in an intuitive way, and I'm moving in an intuitive way, the shape of my body is not up to me. Um, and, and, and I'm not saying that's always easy because we don't get to like pick what we look like and we're still in the society that we're in, but there's ways to manage the feelings around that through therapy and other things besides actually changing the shape of your body or trying to make yourself smaller. That's awesome. So well said, my God, amazing. Um, I am going to ask you to stay right here and I am going to sign off to everybody. Thank you so much for watching this. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, please give me a like and share this video with someone that you think might benefit by watching it. I can, I'm, I'm sure people watching this are watching it for themselves, but maybe for some of the people that they love. Um, so please go ahead and share it. Um, consider subscribing to my channel. Find me on Instagram, Case of the Jills. If you have questions or if you want to get in touch, um, a case of the Jills at gmail.com is the way to get me. Um, thanks so much for watching, everybody. Take care. See you again soon.